Let me see. Just want to make sure. But no, it says that it's being what recorded. Happened? Pardon me? I got the statement that this meeting is being recorded. Yeah, it's a Zoom thing. It auto kicks in. So. Okay, I closed it. Um, so thanks for joining us tonight. We have a very interesting program and we'll get started as soon as I let you know what's coming up. Uh, this Sunday is our Arts Alive uh, holiday concert. Uh, that's Sunday, December 12th at 2 p.m. We have Jenny Riddle joining us and she has a concert that she calls uh, Christmas at the White House. She'll be sharing um, traditional holiday songs and uh, family traditions by the first, many of the first families. And um, so it'll be an afternoon of song and some, maybe some interesting stories about Christmas in the White House. So please um, sign up. Uh, it's a virtual concert, so sign up for it online and I will send you out the Zoom link. Now next Wednesday, the 15th at seven o'clock, we have Remembering Marshall Fields at Christmas. Leslie Goddard <clears throat> is coming back. She was with us last year and she gave a phenomenal program. We had a huge turnout and the program was, was just wonderful. She has a lot of vintage photographs and stories uh, from the holiday seasons over the years, over the decades at Marshall Fields. Um, the holiday windows, the big Christmas tree in the walnut room, Santa, Christmas catalog. Um, and like I said, it was great. So if you haven't seen it, please sign up for that. And if you did see it and liked it, come back and, and, and watch it again with us. Um, I, know, I know you'll love it if you haven't seen it. So tonight, tonight we have a very interesting program, I think. Um, it's called Paris and the Belle Epoque. And uh, Gene Flynn is with us and he is going to uh, take us, uh, kind of guide us through the late 1800s, early 1900s in Paris, when Paris was the artistic, architectural and cultural center of the world. Um, he's going to, uh, give us, like I said, kind of a guide through this beautiful era. And he, from before the, that time and during that time, and then he's also gonna show us uh, some of the reminders and landmarks that still exist today from that time. So please welcome Gene Flynn. Oh, thank you very much, Janet. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I've attended some of the sessions at the Rolling Meadow Library. So it's, a, it's been, been a wonderful experience. Uh, so tonight we are talking about Paris. And uh, uh, my wife and I, Mary, uh, she's, we've been to Europe about 18 times in the 18 years that we've been married. So, and we love visiting France and very many different parts of France. So tonight we're talking about Paris and uh, we have, let's see here. Uh, this, this presentation, it really started at a request of the Itasca Library. Uh, they were doing a program a couple of years ago called One Library, One Book. And the book that they picked was a book called I Always Loved You by Robin Oliviera. And uh, this is a book that talks about the, uh, the romance between Mary Cassatt, who is a, uh, is a, uh, a famous painter and uh, Edward Degas, one of the famous, uh, uh, one of the famous impressionist painters. And uh, so the story, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, and I was asked that one presenter was going to talk about the book itself and the art. I was asked to present about what's happened, what was happening in Paris at that time. And that, that's what I'm covering tonight. So we'll cover a little bit of history of Paris and then talk about the renovation of Paris so that in 1871, Paris was, was the most beautiful city in the world. And, uh, but it had some terrible uh, tragedy in 1871. We're gonna talk about that, the recovery of Paris and France, and then the, what was taking place in the Belle Epoque. Uh, there's even a Chicago connection to this story that I'll cover. So, so first, a little bit of history. And, and this is really a, a few high level elements of French history. 
um, largely told by paintings. So uh, in, the, in the 1700s, Paris was the center of the enlightenment. So, uh, uh, so uh, philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau, they were, they were talking about the rights of man. And uh, up until this time, the only person that really had rights in Europe was the king and the princesses. So, so the Voltaire was saying that the kings really ruled because the people accept that rule. And uh, so he was very influential among the, uh, the, the rich and the, the, the people that gathered at, at homes and had a wonderful meal and some, uh, had some entertainment and they talked philosophy. And the philosophy they talked about really fed totally into the American Revolution and our Declaration of Independence, where our, our Declaration of Independence, it was coming from the ideas of Voltaire and Rousseau that saying that the, the, the right to govern is based on the people accepting that right, and that if the king is not meeting the needs of the people, the people have a right to leave, which, which the American Revolution, we did. Uh, so, but Paris was the center of this type of discussion. Now, we know it also led to the French Revolution in the, uh, the 1879 to uh, 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 1789 to 1794. So French uh, was the, here we have the storming of the Bastille. Uh, we had the, uh, the chaos that created, but also the, the great changes taking place in France. And one of the changes that took place after some of the dust settled was Napoleon. And Napoleon was a, 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 a very successful army officer and as an artillery officer, but he became more and more powerful as he won more and more battles, eventually became a general and was on the ruling council of Paris. And then eventually declared himself emperor. And here we have a painting by uh, David of, of Napoleon crowning himself. And the fellow sitting in the middle in gold is the Pope. And normally the Pope would crown uh, a, a king or an emperor, but Napoleon said, no, you just sit there, I'm gonna crown myself. So he's sending the clear message, I'm more important than the Pope. Uh, so Napoleon had his run, and we know it ended at Waterloo and he was sent off to uh, St. Helena. But uh, after the French, uh, after Napoleon's defeat, the powers to be, England and uh, Prussia and Austria, they wanted to recreate the French monarchy. And here we have King Louis XVIII, who was, the, the, was appointed king of France in 1815. And he ruled, but you know, ruled in a very difficult time. Napoleon gave the French people a real sense of freedom and a sense of self-determination. And they were not really happy to have a, 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 a king back in charge. And uh, we all know the, you know, the stories of Le Miserable, uh, which is the, the book and the, the play and the musical, uh, that was actually covering an uprising of, of 1830 in Paris. But between 1830 and 1848, there were seven different ar armed uprisings in Paris. I mean, almost every other year, there was an uprising. Uh, and, and here we see a painting by Eugene Delacroix. And this is a very romantic painting. This is kind of the romantic period of painting. And we see Lady Liberty there leading, leading the freedom fighters. So we'll, we'll be talking further about the uh, uh, paint, painting styles uh, in, in France. So here we have all this upheavals. Now, in 1848, there was, you know, there was more uprising. There was uprisings in Germany. Uh, but at this point, the French army turned against the king and said, enough is enough, you're not ruling effectively. So the king resigned and France created the second republic. The first republic was uh, at, with the French Revolution. This is the second republic. And Louis Napo uh, Bonaparte, the nephew of Napoleon was elected president. 
And here we have a painting of him uh, from 1855. And Louis Napoleon ruled, uh, but he was elected to a four-year term of president. And he wasn't happy with that. He really felt he was doing such a good job that uh, he should serve longer. And the, the Constitution said he could only serve one term. So in 1851, he dissolved Parliament and with the support of the army, declared himself emperor as Napoleon III. So here we have the second empire. Napoleon had the first empire. Here we have the second empire. And during this time period, uh, for the next 20 years, he was ruling as the emperor. And there were major advances in education, industry, transportation, you know, railroad were coming into play, medicine, when we think people like Louis Pasteur, uh, for a steril a sterilization and pasteurization. So France was really on a very, very successful role with him as the emperor. Now, uh, during the Second Empire, uh, the, the uh, Napoleon III, he really wanted to upgrade Paris. And this is where we're really getting into Paris specific. So, in the early 1800s, Paris was overcrowded. There was disease, crime, uh, unrest throughout the city. You know, needless to mention the, the, set, uh, the six or seven uprisings. And you can almost picture, look at these streets. If there was a group of college students that wanted to barricade a couple streets, the, the streets were so narrow, it would be relatively easy to do that. So what, uh, what, so Napoleon wanted to have a whole different approach. And, and here, here are some of the pictures of the streets. So th this is a street, Rue St. Nicholas Chardonnay, right, which is right near the Louvre, the, the famous museum. Uh, here's another street, Boulevard Saint-Germain. This, this street was actually demolished to make way for the wide boulevards that came into being. Now, the person that put all this together was a guy named Baron Eugene Hausmann. And, and he was the prefect of the region of France called the Prefect of Seine, the River Seine. And, and that's basically Paris and the surrounding area. And he was not an engineer, he was a lawyer, but he was very effective at bringing resources together. And, and his resources and the, the model that he came up with was to create a, 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 a totally new Paris with wide boulevards, with everything emanating from the Arc de Triomphe. And, and, and as part of this effort, he demolished almost 20,000 buildings and constructed 34,000 new buildings. And uh, so the old streets gave way to wide avenues. They had gorgeously proportioned apartment blocks and everything was five stories or less. You know, they're, they, they, you know, at this time, they could have built taller buildings, but he said, no, we want to have a perfectly symmetrical city. And, uh, and, and this is what he created. Uh, this is, you know, from the Arc de Triomphe. And uh, look at the beauty of the, uh, the streets. And, and this made Paris a very beautiful city. It also made Paris a pretty easy city to defend. You could, you could envision if the army came into being, they, they could bring some cannons and, uh, and, and really you control, the, the army could control large areas of the city very quickly by moving troops around these large boulevards. Uh, you know, that probably had a, a place to play. Now, this was enormously expensive, you know, billions and billions of dollars. But, uh, and the government funded part of this, but they couldn't fund it all. But Baron Hausman, he was very clever because he went to the landlords, these people that owned the buildings, and he said, you have a beautiful, you have a building here on this narrow street. I want you to give me, you know, let's say uh, half a million dollars uh, in today's money. And because you're going to, we're going to widen the street, you're going to be able to triple the rent and more than make up this investment that you're making in the remodeling. And he was quite persuasive and uh, with a carrot and a stick, and they were able to accomplish the completion of the renovation of Paris. Now, by 1870, Paris was the most beautiful city in the world. And the, uh, the Napoleon uh, Bonaparte could say, this is 
it, not only do we have the most beautiful city in the world, we have peace and prosperity as far as we can see. France is on a roll. So, so what could go wrong? Well, what did go wrong took place in Germany and in, in Prussia in particular. At this time, uh, Germany in the 1700s, Germany was divided into 300 little principalities and uh, dukes that would have uh, 30 square miles or 20 square miles, 300 of these little uh, little uh, government bodies. And when, when, when Napoleon Bonaparte came through, he took over Germany, but and eventually after the defeat, defeat of Napoleon, there were still 12 or 13 kingdoms within Germany. So Prussia was the largest up north, but in the south, in uh, uh, there was a separate whole separate kingdom around Munich. Bavaria had a, its own king, and we we know him as that uh, mad King Ludwig by at this time period, building these fancy castles. But but up in Prussia, the prime minister to the king was a guy named uh, Otto von Bismarck, and. And he, along with the King Wilhelm I, they wanted to unify Germany around Prussia as the leader. And so, uh, and, and they decided if we have a war that would help us unify Germany. So they, at the time there was a diplomatic squabble. And, and quite simply, to simplify the story, the, the, the throne of Spain was open and the uh, King Wilhelm of, of Prussia said, gee, I'd like my nephew to be the King of Spain. They're looking for to hire a King and I have a wonderful nephew. Uh, well, France was very upset with, with that possibility because they already had Germany to their East, which was a threat to France. To have Spain in uh, German leading, leaning would also have been another threat. So, so the French said, no, no, this is, would be, we, we can't allow this to happen. So, so Germany agreed, they said, okay, we won't send, we won't have the nephew of the king of, of Prussia become the king of, of Spain. However, they worded the letter to the French king in a way that they knew he would find very insulting. So they agreed with the French demand, but they did it in a way that the king of, that the, the emperor of France would find insulting. And indeed he did, he had very thin skin. He, he got insulted very quickly. And what took place is the king said, I'm insulted, we have to go to war with Prussia. So this was the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, 1871. And in July, the French king declares war. They quickly lose four major battles, but you know, the Prussian army was far superior in, in coordination and in mobility, they, they had their reserve system. They, they were highly structured as a, as a powerful army. The French king was captured in Paris. Most of the troops had left Paris to go fight in the battles. So Paris was under siege for four months. No food could get into Paris. I mean, the people were starving and uh, they surrounded by the German army. Eventually the French surrender, including uh, they, they, they surrender. The king of France surrenders. So what could get worse? Well, what actually got worse was pretty bad because the people in Paris with the army gone, the people defending Paris were the same, many of the same people that had been rioting those five or six times up to the, you know, to up till the 1850s. So, so the, it was the, a group of people called the Paris Commune, which was a socialist and kind of revolutionary government, they were running Paris. And even though France surrendered, the people of the Paris Commune said, we, aren't, we are not going to surrender. Paris can surrender, France can surrender, but we are not. And so eventually the, the German army and the German king said to the French, you better send the French army to go take control of Paris. So in May of 1871, the French army came into Paris, they stormed the city, slaughtered tens of thousands of people. The, the exact number probably will never be known, but the uh, women and children, the death uh, was just horrific. 
And, and this was the French army killing the French people of Paris. And, you know, think about that. That's going to have ramifications in terms of trust between the people and the army. So here we have the, uh, the commune carried on. They fought, but uh, eventually they surrendered and more, uh, more of the commune were rounded up and shot. Uh, and the ruin of Paris, the most beautiful city in the world. Here, here's some photos. The picture on the left is Hotel de Ville, which is City Hall. The picture on the right is the Rue de Rivoli, which is near the, the, uh, uh, the Louvre Museum. And uh, there's beautiful buildings in, in shambles in, in Paris. So uh, here we have um, the, can, can, uh, here we have the, the next part of the Belle Epoque. And this is the amazing recovery of Paris and France. And we're going to look at it in two time periods, one 1871 to 1890, and then we'll look at 1890 to 1914. So uh, the, uh, in 1871, after Paris was recaptured, they instituted a new constitution, and it became the Third Republic. Uh, and this republic stayed in being until World War II, when France surrendered to the Germans and uh, uh, but th this was th this was the third republic. So there was a new government, a democracy. Paris quickly repaired the physical damage. So uh, here we have a picture of, of people gathering. This may be one of the celebration days of the of the new constitution or parliament uh, approving it. But but people are celebrating the uh, the 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 new republic. And it, this was the beginning of a wonderful period particularly if you were young and rich. Uh, the theaters, the uh, art, uh, music, uh, there was just a, a wonderful time. Uh, but there were, as you could imagine, there were major social, social and cultural chasms because we had people, uh, we had people that were supporting traditional religious values and we, on the other side, we had people that supported science and the enlightenment and were anti-clerical. They, you know, they, they questioned the church and the church was often in support of the kings. So you know, people that were into democracy were often very skeptical of the church because the church was so much uh, in support of the king. We had in the middle here in red, we have supporters of the French army. And then on the other side, you had many people that distrusted the French army. And, and you could imagine why if they came into Paris and killed you know, 20,000 of their own citizens. Um, and lastly, you had people that were supporting the return to monarchy. And then on the other side, you had people that were supporters of democracy or even anarchy on the other side. So these chasms were there and continued to be throughout the period we're talking about. And it, it shows up even in the geography of, of the places we're looking at. So in 1855, 1860, uh, 1885, the, uh, the building of Sacre Coeur took place, this beautiful building up in Montmartre. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to visit. It was built on the promise uh, of some patrons that if, uh, if, if, if Christ spared, spared Paris, they would build a wonderful monument uh, to, uh, to Jesus and to, and to the Holy Ghost. And that's what they did, this beautiful church, which is there today. But it's right down the block from the Moulin Rouge, which is an embodiment of decadence. You know, so you know, you know, right in, in a three block area, you have opposite uh, polarizations of, of, of values. Uh, we, lots of other things were taking, wonderful things were taking place. So in, we had the wonderful Paris Opera opened, the Paris Garnier, and it's still there today. It's wonderful. Uh, a few years ago, Mary and I were there and we visited and took a tour. Uh, the building itself was just incredible. The statues, not, not only where the operas take place, but even in all the hallways and in the open gathering places, it's, it was a work of art. And here are some of the, you know, opera and theaters taking place. Uh, the uh, the uh, opera Carmen 
uh, by George Bizet, uh, the uh, the Trojans by Hector Berlioz, and and certainly we have Sarah Bar Bernhardt, uh, who was French and was uh, the leading act one of the leading actresses of the time, but also owned a number of theaters. So so she was an actress, but she was also a producer and a manager of theaters. So the modern dance began to emerge as a there's a powerful artistic development. So many things were coming together in Paris to make it really in the forefront of the arts. A music certainly carried that trend. A Claude Debussy and uh, Gabriel Fauré were, you know, they were taking music from the Romantic period to modern music. And uh, Maurice Fauré was, Ravel was, he, he was bringing music, we, he was defined as bringing impressionism to music, you know, taking music to say, you know, here's, here's a sunrise uh, in, in music. So really taking French music to the forefront of Europe, which had all typically been in Vienna, in, in, in German speaking countries, Paris became the, the leader of music in this time period. Uh, literature. Here are some of the people. Uh, Prost. Uh, Emile Zola is very interesting. And we're going to come back and talk about him again. He was a novelist, a journalist, a playwright, uh, very influential in France. And we had Victor Hugo, which we all know as a, uh, as, as a very prolific author, including La Miserable, a wonderful book. Now, in paintings, Paintings, there was lots of developments in paintings. So in, in, at this time period, in the early periods of the Belle Epoque, we had paintings moving from the Romantic period, which is represented here with Lady Liberty from uh, Eugene Delacroix, moving to realism. So this style of art is showing realistic what was taking place in the real people in their lives, as we see here on the left with the gleaners, uh, with the, with peasants, uh, with the cleaning the the fields after the uh, most of the uh, most of the wheat or corn had been removed, they come in to do the final cleanup and to help them survive. So these were some of the works of art of the realism period, and. Uh, the, the, the style of painting was very, that was appreciated came out of a specific school in Paris, and it was the Echo de Beaux-Arts. And we see a, a picture of it here on the left. Uh, this is where artists came, whether you're an American, uh, anywhere in Europe, if you wanted to study art in Paris, you came to this uh, school of modern art for sculpture, for paintings. This is where you came. And every year they had a salon, and uh, in the salon showed the the approved paintings from the, the from the uh, uh, the official Society of Artists of France, which uh, uh, S A F is their initials. But they would select artists that were accepted to show their paintings or their sculptures in the salon. And for example, in 1892. There were 1,700 paintings shown in these various rooms in this large exhibition hall and 1,000 sculptures. And the paintings, as you see from this, uh, this picture, were, would be from uh, eye level up to the ceiling. I, uh, they, they just put paintings all over the place. It was, not, uh, it was not what we see at the Art Institute where they'll have uh, two or three paintings on a wall. They, they might have 60 paintings or more on a specific wall. But, but these were the official recognized painters uh, that were approved. Now, the, the Impressionist painters that we know and love today, they were excluded from that, uh, uh, from the Salon. May, maybe one of them could get one painting in. But by and large, the, the, the official and the critics really looked down on the Impressionist paintings. And most people in Paris had no idea that even the, these impressionist painters existed. It was, you know, the art world knew that they there were these renegades, but most people in Paris would not have known that. But but when we think 
the official painters, they, they might spend four or five months uh, creating a single painting where, where Claude Monet, he created two works of art on the same day you know, because the style that the Impressionists used allowed them to paint quickly. Uh, it wasn't the, the great fine detail where a painter might spend, uh, uh, might spend uh, three days painting the shoe of Napoleon to, to perfection. They, they could create works of art very, very quickly because of the style that they used. And the official art critics, they looked down on, the, on these painters and they said, they're violating all the rules. They paint inappropriate subjects, you know, like uh, dance halls and prostitutes. Uh, they use the wrong colors. They, they use the wrong technique. They're just slapping paint on the canvas. Uh, and uh, so they, 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 they received no respect in the early days of the fresh of the Belle Epoque. And here we see a, another painting by Claude Monet, 1874. Now, lots of other things were taking place. And one of the things that took place was the Paris exhibition. And this was like a world's fair uh, and that took place every two or three years. And it took place in a dedicated area that, that allowed, that had large buildings to show off Paris. And in 1890, the Eiffel Tower was the premier architectural exhibition you know, to demonstrate French technology with steel and with construction. And uh, so here we have the Eiffel Tower. Now, three years later, Chicago was holding our Columbian exhibition in 1893. And the leaders of Chicago were trying to figure out what could we do to equal or to top the Eiffel Tower. And it took them a long time to come up with something. And they finally came up with the Ferris wheel. The engineer Ferris said, I can build this and it wasn't even ready at the opening of the Chicago exhibition, but it came in, it was up and running three or four months later and was a huge success. Now, here is one of the, uh, here is one of the buildings in the, uh, for the, the exhibition, and it's the Gallery of Machines. And at the time, this was the largest covered building in the world when it was built. And, and if we think back to even the early 1800s with Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon stressed education, and previously education was really for the rich. Be anything beyond even like a grammar school was out of the reach of uh, the, you know, the uh, peasants and even the craftsmen, they learned the craft, but Napoleon said, no, we want to have education much more widely available. So, and, and then during the, the second, uh, during the mid 1800s, France had more and more universities come into being, greater and greater engineering was, was stressed along with art and music. And so, so France, in the, by the 1889, they were, they were creating great uh, advances in machinery and in technology, uh, far exceeding what, what England was doing at the time. They, they were coming up with many new things where England had created the Industrial Revolution, by the you know the, the end of the 1880s, France and Germany were far exceeding the new creativity that uh, that the lack of creativity that England had. So so France was proud to demonstrate this at the World's Fair, but it went far beyond just the World's Fair. Here is the the Grand Amphitheater for the students of the Sorbonne University. I mean. Look at the beauty of the of this building of this venue, uh, you know, where the, where the thousands of students could. You know, I, I'd guess there'd be a thousand students or more that could be sitting here. Look at the beauty, the backdrop of the stage, the balconies and the ceilings. Uh, just an incredible work of art. Uh, now I want to jump into the second period of the Belle Epoque because much of what occurred in the first period also just uh, ramped up and continued, but, but there are other things that, are, that were also taking place. Uh, the, first of all, we have some names of new people on the scene, like Picasso, Matisse, Stravinsky, uh, new people, Madame Curie, uh, are joining uh, Louis Renault. The, uh, you know, he's the famous, you know, created the automobile uh, and uh, the uh, Andre Citron, 
created the Citroen automobile. So, so both in uh, art and in technology, uh, more and more things were happening with new faces coming on to the scene. Uh, here is Paris continued to be as beautiful as ever. Here's a painting by Pizarro. Uh, Paris opened their, the Metro was inaugurated in uh, 1900. And uh, what is today one of the most beautiful metros in the world, uh, Paris opened this long be uh, before the London Metro was available. And, uh, and, and look at the art that was dedicated even to the mundane entrance to the Metro. You know, here, here is Art Nouveau taking place in, at the, in this time period. So, so France continued to be, and Paris continued to be on the forefront of art. Uh, here, a painting by Renault, 1870, 1872, but it continued to show the beauty of Paris. But by this period, uh, by the 1890s, uh, the Impressionist painters were really becoming, coming into great acceptance. Uh, here is, here is the, the restaurant at the train station, the train station Gare de Lyon. And uh, the this is a four-star restaurant. Uh, you were qualified as a uh, Michelin four stars back next time. Uh, it beautiful, and, and the, you know, the French take food very, very seriously, and that's re reflected here. Uh, continue, beautiful bridges were built. Uh, here's the shopping of the, of the galleries Lafayette, the department store. Here is the, uh, the building as it opened in 1912. Uh, Mary and I were here in a, a March uh, ten years ago, and it was it was bump it was bumper to bumper of people. It was very very crowded uh, to each of the floors. We finally got away to the they have a wonderful cafeteria on one of the upper floors. So we we finally were able to get away from the the massive crowds to sit down and have a little a little lunch. But uh, just a beautiful building uh, that demonstrates that art should be part of everyday life, that you should be shopping in a beautiful environment. The train station should be a beautiful environment. Uh, by 1890, Claude Monet and his, the movement of the Impressionists were well received. Uh, there is Mary and I standing uh, up on, uh, at his, uh, on the bridge on his property and and Claude, he, uh, he was wealthy enough to purchase a plot of land. And uh, he, he was friends with the prime minister at that point or the premier. And uh, so they were able to even move some train tracks that were there to move them out of the way so that he would have a, a, better, uh, a better use of the land for his art. And so here is Claude's house in Givigny. Uh, we were there on an April 1st, and that was the first day that it was opened. And if you notice in the picture on the upper right, the, the, uh, the, uh, the plants were still in the early stages. This was still very early spring. Later in the year, it would be much, um, the, the plants would be much more lush. Uh, and in 1914, uh, Claude Monet devoted a whole series of, of his paintings to the French people. And uh, when we visited Paris on that trip, uh, they, 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 there's a building uh, right near the Louvre Museum, and it was the Orangerie, where the French kings, where they grew their oranges and protected the orange plants in the winter. And so, so the Paris cr took this building and they modified it to display the Claude Monet artwork that Claude had donated to the people of France. And Mary's looking at one of the sections here on the left. And on the right, you see in, in context, the people watching this room and it, the, the painting goes around 360 degrees of the room. It's a, just a magnificent work of art. Yeah, here is the, uh, the Museum d'Orsay, which was built in 1900 as a train station. And, uh, it, uh, and it, it remained a train station for uh, 80 years, but then it was converted into an art museum. They did not need as much train tr uh, capacity. And uh, so they converted it into the Museum for Impressionism, Impressionist Paintings. 
and it is actually Paris's most visited museum, uh, Musée d'Orsay. But look at the architecture on the left; it's just just stunning architecture. And the and and what we see on the right, this was actually would have been where tracks came in for trains to arrive and depart. And uh, so that's all been converted. Look look at the ceiling. You know, compare that to you. Uh, to Ogilvy Train Center, you know, where, where the trains arrive. This is, the, the ceiling is it's just beautiful. Uh, more art, uh, the, uh, this was uh, uh, another painting by Renault, but, but showing the Paris and the people enjoying life, and which was one of the common themes of the Impressionism, showing dancers, showing everyday people enjoying life or in their occupation. Now, but, Underneath all the glamour, social the social chasm still remained, and and one of the one of the examples of this is the Dreyfus affair, and uh, it it was a in it, in it, it there's a saying that we see sometimes in life that it was better that one man suffer than to tarnish the reputation of the French army. Yeah, you know, we've seen that in other situations, but but here was what was happening. So in 1874, Alfred Dreyfus, who was, who was a Jewish army officer of artillery, he was convicted of treason. Uh, evidence, the, the evidence said that he gave the plans to the German army, some of the battle plans to the German army. Uh, by 1896, there was new evidence that identified the real culprit, but the general su suppressed the evidence. They did not want... If if they admitted it, they would you know admit that not only were they had, uh, that that they they were wrong. They could not even investigate the crime. So they said let's 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 let one man suffer rather than to call disrepute on the French army. By 1898, Emile Zola and Sarah Bernhardt and others were risking their career to stand up for Dreyfus. So so. All of Paris, much of Paris, and much of France was into camps of pro-Dreyfus and anti-Dreyfus camps. So 1899, there was a second trial, and he was convicted again. Uh, but uh, by 1906, the, the pressure to, you know, to realize that there's been a gross misjustice, uh, Dreyfus was pardoned and released. So the, many different outcomes came of this. Um, but one of the outcomes was the political left and the political right within France, great distrust had been building. And in 1905, they created a law that, that demanded the separation of church and state. And even to this day, if you were a political, one political candidate uh, two years ago got in trouble because she put down on her blog, I went to church today, went to mass today. Well, you, that, was, that was a violation of the expectations that your religion is a private issue and that you don't talk about your religion, you don't wear a cross, you don't, uh, if you're a Muslim, you don't wear a, 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 a jihad or a, 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 a head scarf. You know, religion is a private issue and uh, church and state are totally separate. So the, the, all of this was one of the outcomes of this distrust between the camps. Now, the end of the Belle Epoque, as we would obviously expect being 1914, the World War I you know, created, uh, was devastating to France and to England, but it was a whole, you know, a whole generations of young men died. And uh, Mary and I have been into small villages that looked like a village of maybe three or 4,000 people. And you go into the church, and you see four or five hundred names on the plaque of people that died for France, and and sometimes you see seven or eight people with the exact last name. So th these were brothers and fathers and cousins. It 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 was just an enormous toll on the French people, and that carried through even in the you know twenties and thirties in terms of how France reacted, the the distrust between the army, you know the people. You know, many people felt the general sacrificed my family members for no benefit. It was, it, you know, the distrust continued moving forward. Uh, so 
this was this was kind of the the end of the Belle Epoque. And then when we look at this time period, um, Mary McCullough wrote two wonderful books that the the uh, the, uh, the the and one is the Twilight of the Belle Epoque, and the other is the Dawn of the Belle Epoque. And one of the points that she makes is that the Belle Epoque was never the golden age uh, that people later attributed to it, uh, especially those that did not have wealth uh, or privilege of society's upper echelons. It uh, yet. When you look back after World War I, the people yearn back and look at that wonderful time period, and they made the Belle Epoque as the golden age, where, where it was for some, but for many people, it was still a time of injustice, a time of struggle. Uh, so it, 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 sometimes our past, we blow, blow all out of proportion. And perhaps that was, was, was taking place with the Belle Epoque. Now, these are the two books I mentioned, The Dawn of the Belle Epoque and The Twilight of the Belle Epoque. And in the book, Mary follows all these players uh, and what they were doing year by year, you know, with, with the, uh, uh, the impressionist painters, the architects, the, uh, the industrialists that came into play, what they were doing and how they were establishing themselves, the rise and fall of different trends. So very interesting books. Now, uh, there's uh, today the beauty of Paris is the vast majority of what we talked about is still there. Uh, you know the that you can see and you can take the wonderful metro and visit large parts of Paris, all in central Paris. The the points I was talking about. Now I have a little extra here, that, and that we have time to cover it. And the the extra little cookie for today is the, the connection, the Chicago connection to the Belle Epoque. And, uh, and, the, and the connection was very interesting. When we look back in the 1890s in Chicago, we had, you know, the, we, we were on the cusp of winning the World's Fair, you know, the, 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 uh, the 1893 uh, Columbian exhibition. But in, in the, you know, 1889 and 1890, Chicago had these enormously wealthy industrialists, including uh, Marty Ryerson, who was one of the richest men in America with real estate and other holdings. Uh, he and people like Marshall Fields and, uh, uh, and you know, the armors, the people that own the meatpacking, they said, you know, we, have a, we have an industrial city here and we're known for industry. Uh, we need to have, you know, build up our reputation for art and culture. And so they said, let's create an art institute. And Marty Ryerson, he was on the board of the art institute. So he went over to France uh, on a vacation and he, he bought the first of what became 17 Monet paintings uh, and also five works from Renault. So, so the, the Chicago art, you know, the art buyers of rich were buying these art for their homes, but they eventually all wound up at our art institute of Chicago. And what was interesting from my reading is the people, the Rockefellers in New York, the wealthy of New York, they wanted to, when they went to you know, Europe, they wanted to buy the old masters, like the Rembrandts. They, you know, they wanted the, uh, the, the, the Italian and the, the Dutch painters, where Chicago, uh, I don't know who advised them, but they, they con connected with these young in, um, in the new movement of uh, impressionist painting. Uh, another person in play here is Mrs. Potter Palmer. And she bought three of the Monet haystacks and eventually owned 50 of his paintings. And, uh, and, and, they're, and, and the beauty is they're down at the Art Institute for us to visit. Uh, here is a, uh, a picture of the Palmer house on Lakeshore Drive uh, from this time period. Uh, you, look at the, you look at the wonderful rug there in the front. But in the back, the, many of the paintings that, that are, were donated to the Art Institute are sitting back there. It's hard to tell which was a haystack. And, but these were, many of these were the wonderful Impressionist painters that, uh, that they were able to buy. And in, in 1914, 
Uh, the uh, Ryerson went back and met with um, Claude Monet and said, I'd like to give you $5 million for the rest of your paintings. You still have 50 or 60 paintings here that, uh, that was in his inventory. And Monet just laughed because he knew at this point he was a national hero and his paintings were a national treasure. So, so I'm sure he felt I've given enough to Chicago. I don't need the money. I want my work to be to stay here and be part of the French, be part of the French culture. So I think that's the end. So that that is the Paris in the Belle Epoque, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, welcome questions or comments that uh, anybody anybody might have. I think you can unmute. I think can uh, Janet can people unmute themselves. Yes, they can unmute. They can just click on their little uh, microphone that has the red line through it if yes. they want to um, ask any questions. Does anybody have any? I I was so, um, I've never been to Paris, so I'm very jealous that you've been there 18 times. Yes. <laughs> but um, the interiors of some of those buildings were just, I mean, they're magnificent. There's no Absolutely. It, it, uh, and it's and right now travel to Europe is very problematic with the uh, with the pandemic. Right, but there there's so many uh, there's so many options to travel to Paris. Uh, one of uh, Mary and I we've traveled in the summer and we stayed for two or three weeks, but sometimes we've just flown to Paris or London for a, a week or ten, you know nine days in March, and. The Air France and British Airlines, they have these things called holiday packages. And for a ridiculously low amount of money, uh, you know, may, maybe $1,100, they will fly you to London or Paris. You stay there in a wonderful hotel for nine days. Uh, in the summertime, the airfare alone might be $1,200. So here in March, they're giving you the whole city for, uh, for an incredibly low amount of money, and Paris and London, you you can spend. You, you don't. You would never want to rent a car. You, but the, the great metro will take you all through these historic buildings and these historic areas. You can walk and just enjoy these wonderful cities. Uh, and Paris is a delight any time of the year. But we found it very very uh, user friendly uh, in March and April before the before the summer crowds. Mm -hmm. I have tip. a question. I have yes. a question. Yes, Sylvia. Um, the Germans started three wars, apparently, in the 19th century and two wars in the 20th century. Yes. Was, was Paris also destroyed in the uh, following wars? Or, well, or uh, well, which, which war was worst for Paris? So the, the war for Paris, the, the Franco, the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, that's when the when the French army had to go in and retake the town. That that did a lot of damage. Uh, World War One, uh, uh, Paris was not bombed. The, the German army came close, and I think they could even lob some shells into Paris. But but there was there was very little damage to the city in World War One, and fortunately in World War Two. Uh, it was there was no damage. The, the, the damage to Paris was the demise of the Jews. Uh, that, at, with the help of the French police, I should add, the French police helped round up the Jews and send them to the death camps. But the buildings of Paris were not damaged the, uh, during World War II. And at the end of the war, Adolf Hitler ordered his generals to blow up Paris and to blow up the monuments. But the, uh, there's a wonderful story of, of the saving of Paris and the generals deciding to go against Adolf's orders uh, to preserve the beauty of Paris. So, the, so Paris did, did not, it was not damaged physically much in World War II, fortunately. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions for Jean? When was Louvre uh, built? Oh, so so that oh that was built. Uh, are you still there? Yes. Okay. I, yes, I, I hit the wrong button. So that was built by the French kings uh, in the in the thirteen hundreds 
for their their palace. And so when Napoleon took over, when Napoleon Bonaparte took over, uh, he brought he brought artwork from around Europe. He was a great collector. So when when he defeated an army in uh, Italy or in Germany, he he was a great looter of art and brought them back to Paris. Uh, and uh, so he started to put that art in the, the what was the palace of the Louvre. And then in the uh, 1830s and 1840s, it became the museum that was open to the public. Well, in 1812, Napoleon uh, went to Russia. In, yes. Um, yeah. Did, did he stole any paintings from Russia too? I, I don't well, remember, was he in Moscow too, but maybe Petrograd or-, or Yeah, whatever. I think he, he made it to Russia, but it, um, the, the Russians burnt much of the city. So they, I don't think he, even if he looted uh, Moscow, uh, his, his retreat from Moscow in the winter was such a debacle. I don't think much of that made it back to Paris, even if he, uh, even if he did loot some of the homes in Moscow. That, that was part of Napoleon's downfall trying to uh, take on the Russians with the winter approaching. Surprisingly, Adolf Hitler had the same problem. But they took a lot of paintings. Adolf Hitler took the oh, Germans. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Adolf, he was a big, yeah, he, uh, Adolf, uh, the Germans, wherever they went, they, uh, they, they scooped up art uh, for, their, uh, for their own collections. They, I think there are still a lot of paintings in somebody's personal collections yeah, yeah. taken from, from Petrograd, especially. Absolutely. Okay, any other questions for Jean? Um, well, if there are no further questions, I, I want to thank you very much. Uh, Jean, for this talk, um, as I said at the beginning or before we started, I always learned something. I learned a lot tonight. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. I'm delighted to be here. So uh, everyone have a wonderful holiday season and, uh, uh, in, uh, and we can look forward to uh, future travels to Europe when things settle down. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll offer that. Paris will be there when we are ready to go. Okay. All right, thank you again. Thank you, thank you all. Okay.